please join me in welcoming my colleague and friend, Michael Kittle. Spirit, uh, I just want to say first thank you to uh, the Fordham, to the Department of Communications Media Studies for allowing us this awesome space. Um, thank you also to Stony Brook and, uh, and to Charlie Robbins, my home for the past um, 30 years. <laughs> um, I want to thank also, today is the actual pub date for the book. Um, so. Uh, several book events here in New York tonight. So she'll be here, if she's not here yet, she'll be here soon. I do want to thank her. Um, and I want to thank my partner in crime, Pete Hutchison, whose film, who's a part of whose film you will see tonight uh, in, in a little bit. Um, it's been just a gas to work together on this. So thank you, Pete. For those who you know, don't know me that well, uh, those of you who know me well will know that, that I don't go anywhere without thanking the people who are closest to me. Those of you who are New Yorkers of a certain age um, will remember at least growing up listening to the very famous Lou Gehrig speech on July 4th, 1939, his last day as, in, on the field at Yankee Stadium. And those of you who were Anybody remember this? Have you seen it, right? Today, echo today, I consider myself, I consider myself the luckiest man, the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I say that every single day, and you would too if you were married to Amy Aronson and had Zachary Kimmel for a son. about this. And I also want to thank the formers who are here with us tonight. Um, and uh, because I, I, you will, you'll, you'll meet some of them later uh, on, our, on our panel. I think what they've done is enormously courageous. They're heroes to me in the way that they have turned their lives around and are now helping other people turn their lives around. Um, I wouldn't be standing here and this book would not exist were it not for them and their, their ability and their willingness to open their, their stories up to me uh, and, and to take me in. Uh, and weird as it may sound for this Jewish boy from Brooklyn, I now consider some of them to be friends. Um, so let me say a little bit about this book. Um, Healing from Hate is a book about young men who once had swastikas tattooed on their necks, who spent their days working to overthrow the government. Their nights moshing to hate porn music, downing painkillers and roaming the streets, looking for immigrants and black people to beat up, hoping, if all went well, that they would send at least a few to the hospital. So obviously this is my most optimistic book. <laughs> it's optimistic because these guys got out. It, they came back. They proved that no matter how dark your vision, how deep the hole in which you sunk, there's hope. Strength, support, resilience, and a bracing honesty to face over and over again the consequences of your action. So that's what this book is about. Is that me? <laughs> of course. Of course. <clears throat> Worst nightmare. <laughs> um, I'm trying to turn the ringer off. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about where this book comes from. I've been working on this. Um, uh, my friend Robert Orell reminds me that I first went to uh, talk to Exit in Sweden in 2004. Um, so I've been working on this book for a while. Um, and, uh, and I've been working on this research for a while. In 2013, I published a book called um, Angry White Men. Uh, and uh, that 2013, the name Trump does not appear anywhere in the book. Um, but let me tell you, November 2016, boy, did my phone start ringing. Um, so, and that book, in that, for that book, I interviewed actives. I interviewed guys who were in the 
extreme right, white nationalist movement in the, around the United States. Now, I didn't intend to do this. Um, I thought actually as a researcher I could get away with doing research online. Because I figured I'd just go through, you know, like Stormfront or some portal, you know, meet them in chat rooms, listen to what they said, and write a book. And so I would be in these chat rooms, and, you know, there were like five or six other people, and they would say all kinds of racist and anti-Semitic and hateful things. But I had no idea who they were. So I started fantasizing, like, that four of these are, like, graduate students in anthropology. And, you know, two of them are high school kids, like, goofing around. And one of them's a real white supremacist, but I have no idea who. So I figured I have to go meet them. Um, this was not nearly as hard as you think. Um, I did not, although I did end up going, in, meeting some in, 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 uh, in uh, Southern California, um, in, the, in the South, it's actually rather easy. Um, I, I found most of them actually outside of gun shows in, super, in Western New Jersey and, the, and what was once the Mason-Dixon line. Um, rural Southern Tier Pennsylvania, Northern Tier Maryland. Uh, Frankie knows this neighbor, this, this area around Lancaster real well. So, you know, the thing about American, high, American school systems are we are, they are so chronically underfunded that they rent out their, their gymnasiums to traveling gun shows. Like, I wouldn't necessarily walk into the gun show, but it would be interesting to me that right outside there were all these tables with, with leaflets on them. Those were my guys. They're about leaflets about how the government's doing this to you, how you have to do that. So I, those are the guys, I didn't even need to go into the gun show because I had all the guys who were standing around with the literature. And I will tell you, those of you who, those of you who, are, who will fess up to being social scientists in the room, um, there's lots of biases in the research. A lot of them didn't want to talk to me, others of them did. Um, I'm just going to assume that, for the sake of my argument, that they, that they wouldn't have been significantly different in their, in their attitudes. But here's what, they, here's what I found, and here's what I wrote about in Angry White Men. What I found was, that masculinity becomes a way that they understand their own position, they understand their relationship to others, and it becomes a vehicle by which they can then um, join and, and, and be recruited into the movement. So masculinity works in three ways. One, it helps you understand your position. You have been emasculated. You have lost your sense of manhood because of because of uh, corporate capitalism, because of multiculturalism, because of feminism, whatever the reason, you've lost something. It's been taken from you. And it's been given to those who don't deserve it. These others, whether it's, whether it's immigrants, or black people, or Jews, or women, or gays, no matter who, they don't deserve it, you do. And the third was, so if you join us, you'll get it back. You'll, you'll be able to retrieve your manhood. Those were the three things that I kept hearing. Here, listen, you don't have to believe me. I'm not going to read from the book. I'm going to read from what some of, their, what, what some of them told me. This, is, this was published in a white, white nationalist uh, newspaper um, in the late 1990s. It just gives you an idea of this emasculation. Northern males have continued to become more wimpish, the result of the media-created image of the new male, more pacifist, less authoritarian, more sensitive, less competitive, more androgynous, less possessive. The controlled media, the homosexual lobby, and the feminist movement have cheered. The number of effeminate males has increased greatly. Legions of sissies and weaklings, of flabby, limp-wristed, non-aggressive, non-physical, indecisive, slack-jawed, fearful males, who, while still heterosexual in theory and practice, have not even a vestige of the old macho spirit, so deprecated today, left in them. Not bad writing. <laughs> um, that always impressed me. Um, so, so that was the that was the first um, the first thing, and then um, and so. I, I began to think maybe, you know, I, and I was interviewing these, these guys, and I kept hearing this over and over again. They have taken what's rightfully ours, given it to others who don't deserve it. We're getting it back. We're taking it back. And I decided in Angry White Men to only focus on the U.S., but I was also working at the time. I was also hearing about these programs around the, the world that were helping young men get out of the movement. 
And this was really exciting to me. Um, so I, through, through friends, I contacted Exit, which is, a, which is the, the sort of the, the, the premier program like this in Stockholm. And Robert Arell, who was the head of Exit then and now, um, invited me to come and interview uh, and do some interviews there, which I did. Um, it's an amazing project, and they have. A, and you'll hear a little bit about it later. Um, Robert wins the award of having traveled the furthest to get here tonight. He's come from Stockholm, um, and so you'll hear a little bit about what the exit model does. It's really quite impressive, and they had a lot of government support for it. So, um, so through through Robert, I began to do some interviews. I even interviewed um, a guy named Jackie Arcloff. Who is the who is who was told to said to me was the Charlie Manson of Sweden? He's serving a life uh, sentence in a maximum security prison in in Sweden um, for having killed two police officers in a botched bank robbery where they were trying to raise money for the the movement. Um, he then had a kind of epiphany in prison that where he wanted to try and begin to turn his life around. Uh, he reached out, I think, originally to you to exit, asking to, to sort of meet with, with people, and they've been working with him ever since. So I, I, I interviewed him three times in, and in three different prisons. Um, P.S., if you ever have to go to a maximum security prison, <laughs> try and go to one in Sweden. The food's not bad. Um, so, so, but here's what I... Um, but in, in my interviews with, with, with them, I began to hear, hear something. I heard this idea over and over again that, they, that, they, that there was an effort that they needed to find a way that they could come back and find the, feel themselves to be stakeholders, that they could feel themselves to feel like validated as men. This is the conversation I kept hearing over and over again, that I, if they're going to come back, they need jobs, they need to have good relationships, they need some way to come back, to come out of it. Um, and, uh, and what was interesting to me, the actives that I interviewed here in the U.S., their average age was about, um, was about 34. The average age of the guys in exit in Sweden who were leaving the movement was, at least at the time, somewhere around 18. Or is that, about, that's about right. And there have been, uh, you told me I think recently, there have been um, like 900 people who have gone through the exit program. Of them, virtually all were male. Probably 30 or so women, it, it, not, it, even. not even that. Um, I interviewed like three of, three of those women at, at various points. Um, but it's so clearly a masculinist project. And what was interesting to me is for the young men in exit, they were getting out when a lot of the guys in the U.S. were getting in. And that, that I thought was kind of interesting. So I listened to them. And for them, it was often a kind of adolescent masculinity project, less about ideological commitments and more about being an adolescent guy. Here's one guy. Um, and he's, uh, so he's talking about when he was 14 and he joins up. He says, when I was 14, I'd been bullied by a lot of classmates. By coincidence, I got to know an older guy who was a skinhead. He was really cool, so I decided to become a skinhead myself, cutting off my hair, donning a black bomber jacket and Doc Martens. The next morning, I turned up to, in my school at, in my new outfit. In the gate, I met one of my worst tormentors. When he saw me, he was stunned, pressing his back against the wall with fear shining out of his eyes. I was stunned as well by the powerful effect my new image had on him and others. Being that intimidating, Boy, that was a great feeling. Did you hear anything here about the ideology? How are you going to talk to this guy? How are you going to get him out? Think of why he goes in. These guys go into the movement. Um, and, and, and it is not because of some kind of ideological commitment. It's because of their experiences. Imagine with me for a minute um, a composite. Imagine a guy. Um, let's, I'll say he's 17, it's around 7.30, 8 o'clock at night at a skater park in, um, in let's say, out right in, in Long Beach, California. He's the last one at the, at the skater park. Everyone else has gone home. He's still there, hanging out. He's not very popular in school. He doesn't really like school very much. In fact, he hardly ever goes. Um, he loves video games, uh, but he's completely alone. He's, he's, 
the target of bullies, you know, on occasion. He doesn't, he doesn't get along with his parents at all if they don't, just, they don't beat him up all the time, if he just doesn't get along with them. And into the park comes a bunch of guys who are skinheads. And they, and they kind of come up to him and they say, hey, you want to hang out with us? We have awesome parties. We all get drunk. There's girls. And then we all take painkillers and we go out on the streets and we look for people to have fights with. It's fantastic. Come on, join us. And what happens is they feel a connection. They feel what they get is community, connection, uh, brotherhood, things that they were missing in their lives, a feeling that, they are, that they're valued, that their masculinity is val validated. This is not an idea. So how are you going to get this guy out? How, once he's in, how are you going to get him out? Are you going to go up to him and say, Dude, I think your interpretation of Mein Kampf was a bit off. <laughs> no! You are not going to engage with them ideologically about the purity of their ideas. You are going to say, I see you, and this is why I think the work of the formers getting others to get out is so valuable. I know what you have been, been through. There is brotherhood on the other side. There is a validation of your masculinity if you become a stakeholder in this, in this system. If you have a relationship, if you have children, the stories of guys getting out are almost always stories of a relationship helping them out, uh, a relationship with their, with their child, with a, with a partner. That one was not me, I know that. <laughs> um, with, their, with their partners, with their, some, in some cases, a mother sort of intervenes and says, you know, Choose us or them. These guys get out and are able to stay out because they find a community and brotherhood and validation of their masculinity on the other side. That was really, I, I found that to be really important because you don't, they don't get indoctrinated right away. They get indoctrinated a lot later. First they're in, then first they're hanging out. This is what the guy who was the founder of Exit Deutschland, um, where I also uh, where I also did, uh, did some interviews. Um, this is what he says about his own, his own work, getting guys, helping to get guys, uh, get guys into the movement. This was his recruiting strategy. He says, I like to approach 14 to 16 year olds after school. We looked for kids wearing bomber jackets and Doc Martens. Usually they didn't really have a political position, but for whatever reason they decided it was cool to be right wing. The first thing I did when I met one of these boys was show him that I wanted to be his friend, to hang out with him, which coming from someone older, especially someone over 20, was a real compliment. I'd act a lot like an older brother. We'd go, for, we'd go into the woods together and do things like Boy Scout exercises, building forts, making trails. I'd always slip a little bit of ideology against foreigners along the way saying some racist things like how there were such, there were such big differences between the white and black races but only casually at first. What they did was gradually bring in ideology. First, you're one of us, we love you, you're our brother, and then later, and you have a sacred mission to protect and, pre and preserve the white race. Only later did the ideology come. So if you want to bring these guys out, you have to figure, you have to understand how they get in. And so what I tried to understand was the sort of the masculinity project I felt that if entry was so, it was so tied up with validation of masculinity, if your experience in the movement was so tied up with validation of masculinity, that the, that the getting people out would have to be a visceral, an emotional process, not an ideological one. Now this is true, this was true in my interviews with, the, with three groups that I worked with, Exit Sweden, Exit Deutschland, and then the most recent, uh, recently formed in 2011, Life Against Hate, here in the United States. Um, with, and you'll meet some of the, the members of Life After Hate, the founders of Life After Hate, in a few minutes. Um, and they, are, they, they, really, they all really impressed me with doing exactly this sort of thing, meeting the guys where they are, understanding their experiences, and bringing them out. Uh, and, but I, I should say also about Life After Hate, they were, they, they have decided to implement an exit program about which you'll hear. Um, they, in 2016, they were uh, granted funding from the Justice Department uh, through the countering violent extremism uh, program that the Obama administration had, had, had begun. 
Their funding was canceled under this administration because, of course, it didn't have anything to do with Islamism. So they've only funded projects that are about Islamic terrorism. Uh, and then, in order to do, in order to sort of balance this out and sort of think, think this through a little bit more, I worked with a fourth group in London called Quilliam. Quilliam is run by imams who help jihadists get out of the Islamist movement. So I wanted to have a contrast with all of the white supremacist, um, white nationalist groups and talk to a little bit uh, about that. I, interestingly, a lot of that work is in fact ideological. The imams actually go into prisons and sit with jihadists and talk with them about their interpretations of the Quran. Why? Because these guys who go into the Islamist movement, you all, you all know this stuff, they go into the Islamist movement when they're in university and they are absolutely poised in between their traditional, they, these are first generation, uh, uh, you know, uh, Londoners, most of many of them, um, first generation in, in, you know, English citizens whose parents came from Pakistan. They, the parents want them to have arranged marriages, want them to, to live by this very traditional Islamic law. They don't want that. They want, they're in England. They want to hang out with that, but they can't do that because the English are so bloody racist that they'll never be accepted there. So they're absolutely poised in between. They go to universities like London Metropolitan University, Leeds Beckett University, and they sit there and, and imams come to campus to recruit them by quoting, because every, every, every Muslim boy should have memorized at least most of the Quran, they actually sit there and they talk about verses. They talk about the actual text. So if they're going to get out, the, the imams actually have to talk with them about their interpretation of text. But that's rarely the case with the, with the white supremacists. So that was basically what I found. Was, now, and I want to be very clear about this, because I can't tell you how many times I am accused of, of, of doing this. Kimmel thinks that masculinity explains white supremacy. Clearly he's wrong because political economy and social life and all of glo global neoliberal economics, etc. I get all that. I'm not saying that by understanding masculinity you understand it all. What I am saying is that you can't understand it without also understanding gender, without also bringing in this experience, because that's where the guys are at themselves. So that's basically what I, what I tried to do um, in the book. Um, I'm going to tell you one little story. Uh, rather than read, read your story, I, I met some really incredible people, some of whom you will meet tonight, but one guy I met in Germany. And I want to tell you the story, because this was one of those moments that it's very, it's difficult to, to I, uh, write, and as you'll see in the book, those of you who, who, who have the book, you'll see that each, so there's four chapters on four organizations, Exit Sweden, Exit Deutschland, Life After Hate, and Quilliam. And in before each one of them, each, each one of those sort of organizational or country discussions, there's a profile of one guy from each place. Um, and the one, that, and so since it's uh, one that's not represented, Tonight, I thought I would just tell you the story that I tell in the book about Matthias, who I met at Exit Deutschland. Um, because I, I, that's not his real name. Um, but, I, but I want to tell you the story because for me, this was one of those moments that, as an interviewer, I found it, I, I said, you know, this, I, am, I'm, I can't believe I'm hearing this. I'm really lucky that I'm actually being trusted with this information, and I don't know how to process this yet. So Matthias, uh, is about 32, 33. He looked very much like a sort of a younger version of Tom Petty, sort of blonde hair parted in the middle. Um, and he was a youth organizer, had been a youth organizer for the, uh, the National Socialist uh, Front, uh, National Socialist Party in, 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 uh, in Germany. He'd been East, East German. And he was, as I said, about 32, 33 when I met him. And he said his mother was the 60s, gen my generation, the generation born right after the war. His mother was a hippie, lived on a commune in Portugal, and told him one day that she really couldn't tell him which of three men was his actual father, because it was a commune and everybody was sleeping with everybody else. She really didn't know. He grew up hating her. He hated communes, he hated the whole thing. So he came back to East Germany. And East Germany, as many of you know, during that time, one of the ways to resist East German so uh, socialism was, of course, to revert back to who was, who was German socialism's enemy, right? who was a Russian enemy, National Socialism. 
So East Germany was a, fair, was a hotbed for neo-Nazi activity. He becomes a youth organizer. He's really good at it. He loves the, the kids really connect with him. He really connects with them. And he's staying with his grandparents. And his grandparents over the years had said, you know, occasionally said some, you know, racist sorts of things, but he didn't pay much attention to it. There's a lot of casual racism about Turkish immigrants um, in Germany anyway. So he says to me one night, he's having dinner with his grandparents. And, um, and he's talking, and his grandparents say, well, what are you doing? He says, well, actually, I'm working to end this government, you know, to bring back the, the, the right. Uh, you know, I've, I've completely you know, given myself over to the return of National Socialism. After dinner, he says, my grandmother got up and put the dishes away. My grandfather said, come upstairs, I want to show you something. So they walk upstairs past the bedroom level to the attic, and there's a lock on the door. His grandfather takes out a key, opens the lock in the attic door, opens the door to what was a veritable museum of Nazism. His grandfather's original Vermont uniform, flags, pamphlets, guns, sabers, knives, everything, pins, uh, buttons, and his grandfather says to him, I've been waiting all my life to show you this. You have to finish what we started. This sounds familiar, doesn't it, Randy? And so this, so now imagine when he goes to them and says, I'm leaving the movement. Well, of course, they haven't spoken since. Now he, now he is trying de really hard to make a new life for himself outside of the movement and outside of this family inheritance. It's like, the, like National Socialism skipped a generation for him. I, and when, I, when he told me this story, I, re, I, I was reminded, and this is how I want to end, you, you, those of you who've seen the book, the, the, the first line of the book is a story about my grandmother. My grandmother uh, in, in Brooklyn lived on the sixth floor of an apartment on Shore Road from which we could watch the building of the Verrazano Bridge. Sixth floor of an apartment building on Shore Road in Brooklyn. She had a little suitcase by the door with just like a change of clothes and some toiletries. And when I was six, I said to her, like, Grandma, why, what, what, what's that suitcase for? And she said, just in case. I said, what do you mean just in case? I was six, I didn't really quite get it. She said, just in case they come again. That's what I grew up with. That's what I learned from my, my grandparents. I, I, I met, you know, the butcher on the corner had a tattoo. The guy who delivered our milk had a tattoo. This is what I learned when I was growing up in the 1950s uh, in, in Brooklyn. And what I want to say to you, and then I had this conversation with this guy who tells me that this is what he inherited from his grandparents and how he actually has turned his life around. And so the way I want to end this, before I introduce Pete, um, I hope that you'll, that you'll read the book and, and find something useful in it. But what I want to tell you is after meeting the guys that you are going to meet tonight, I do not think I will ever need to put a suitcase by the door of my house. Thank you.